Oh, good morning. And it's uh, worth putting particular emphasis on that word good on Good Friday. And though we remember a brutal and terrible event in one sense, the murder of innocence, the, the death of the Son of God. In another sense, it is good for God's people because He died for us. And what a joy it's been to sing these hymns together and to hear them sung so well, uh, praising God for what He has done. And we're going to be looking at this once more in Holy Scripture. And those of you that have been with us for the last uh, few months, we've been going through Genesis, and it just so happened that the next portion of Genesis tied very well uh, with the theme of Good Friday. And so we're still in Genesis this morning. And I ask that you turn there uh, to chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Genesis 3, verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, all over the world on this day, there are those that are gathered in your name to remember the events upon a cross 2,000 years ago. Many are gathered in sincerity with joy and thanksgiving in their hearts and a renewed commitment to know and serve you with their lives. And many, we fear, are also gathered out of pure tradition out of a sentimentality and not out of any genuine desire to honor you or know you. Whole denominations indeed, Father, have, have gone that way. So we ask you that by your Spirit you would shake the nations this day to bring many to faith and repentance in your Son, that they might behold the glories that we see with the eye of faith and join us in worship of the living God. Do we ask work for your name's sake, both here and among the nations? Amen. The idea of covering sin or guilt is as ancient as the act and feelings themselves. Adam and Eve tried with fig leaves. Hitler buried the bodies of his concentration camp victims as, a, as the Allied armies defeated his own. Nixon tried to conceal his involvement in the Watergate scandal. Putin quietly withdrew his surface-to-air missiles to hide Russia's involvement in the downing of a passenger plane in 2014. China successfully hid the deaths of over 200,000 people in 1975 when a series of dams collapsed because of poor design and construction, only becoming generally known about 15 years later. And that nation and North Korea have both quietly pretended they have not incarcerated hundreds of thousands of people in so-called re-education camps. Big corporations shred their records to hide embezzlement. Big industry suppresses reports to point to health risks with their products. Internet users delete their browsing history to avoid discovery. Dictators and authoritarian regimes profess that they do not kidnap and torture dissidents. Liberals try to diminish the crime of murdering unborn babies by calling it the termination of a fetus. Spouses try to hide their affairs. The thief tries to rob under cover of darkness and the religious person thinks to earn their salvation by making up for their past with acts of charity or devotion. And you can go on. Anything for which a person feels shame or guilt or at least the, the fear of discovery, and there's been an effort to cover it. Only there's one insurmountable problem. The Bible says 
No creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. However, there is one covering which will work. More precisely, there is one payment for personal sin that God will accept, and that will be our great concern this morning, though we'll cover some other territory along the way. Those of you that have been with us will know, yes, we've been in the book of Genesis. In chapter 3, we've been answering the question as to why there is wickedness in this world, this, this great evil. Where does it come from? And we saw that mankind has an enemy, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, and Adam willfully followed in rebellion immediately afterwards. When the Lord God arrived, he, he called out to them in grace, but they did not respond with repentance. So he pronounced judgments against all involved. First he cursed the serpent to restore order to humiliate the devil, and to show the outcome of rebellion. Yet in doing so, God also promised that one day Satan would be defeated by the offspring, the seed of the woman, that a Savior would come, namely Jesus, with conflict existing between the people of God and everyone else uh, before and after those events. Next, the Lord God spoke to the woman. He pronounced grievous consequences for childbearing, from conception to the cradle and beyond but also for the companionship that she would previously enjoy with her husband. Her sinful impulses and desires would be exercised toward him and his wicked behavior back towards her, as has been seen all through history. And lastly, God spoke to the man. Because of Adam, all creation was cursed to disruption, hostility, and decay. And all human labor would be marked with difficulty and pain and frustration. But worst of all, all people would age and grow sick and weak and die. And all of this is familiar to you because it's what stains the chronicles of the human race. Satanic deception, persecution, pain, suffering, death. It's all there. It all started at the fall and in the curses that followed. But now that that verdict has been given, the judge, as it were, sets aside his gavel and he steps down from behind the bench and he draws near to these wretched people before him. No, not at the expense of his justice, because God is not divided against himself, but because of his loving purposes through them, because of his promise to bring them a Savior. And that brings us to the first of two points. Hoping in the promises of God, or the promise of God, singular, verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. What does Adam do after hearing of the devastating news of creation's fall and the suffering and death that will follow? What does he do? He puts his faith in God's Word. Well, what do I mean? How do we know that? Because of the name he gave to the woman. He calls her Eve, which in the original meaning is life or alive or especially life giver. So, so Adam would die, he knows that, but he's not unintelligent, and he's heard what the Lord God said to the serpent of a future Savior coming through his wife, one who will defeat Satan and undo the effects of the curse on earth, who will defeat death itself. And so in faith, the name that Adam gives to his wife is life giver, Eve. In uh, Hebrew, Chava. so Adam and Eve is actually Hadam and Chava. But as language developed and various transliterations of words and, and uh, letters followed in a roundabout way, we ended up with Eve in the English. But the, the meaning here is what is important. Adam latches onto that because verse 20, she will be the mother of all the living. Through her, there is hope. Through her, there would be life despite centuries of death and decay. It is a declaration of his faith, and in fact, the tenses of the original words here are what scholars like to call the prophetic perfect, meaning it's as good as done. 
That's how sure Adam is that God will keep his word. The hope that Adam has is not some vague, cross your fingers and hope for the best type of hope, but rather it's a prophetic certainty that God will do exactly as he has promised. And that's how you and I are to respond to any rebuke from God with repentance and faith in what he says. That's how we are to respond to anything God has promised with an utter certainty as to the stated outcome because God cannot fail and God cannot lie. Later, Cain would respond to God's correction with bitterness and anger, his face full of resentment, frustrated in his own desires, the way of a fool. But here, Adam's decision is the way of the wise. He believes God. He repents of his previous sin. And, and having recently failed Eve with his passivity and betrayed Eve with his accusations, now Adam looks on her with a renewed sense of wonder. This fabulous creature that can bring life into the world. He thinks through her. Through my wife, one day our salvation will come. And no, he didn't have all the details. He wouldn't have worked it all out. But, but he understood everything he needed to. God had promised. And that one day through that promise, a Savior would come. He, he clung to that with ironclad certainty. He called his wife Eve. And so it was for the next 4,000 years, generations of human beings will be born through Eve, every man, woman, and child, chasing their line back to these two people, uh, what, what scientists might call the mitochondrial Eve or the Y chromosome Adam, if they were honest enough to make the connection to the Bible, all coming through here until one day, finally, the Savior would arrive. Every human being alive or in history, coming by way of the life-giver Eve, and through whom one day would come the true life giver, that is, God himself. And for those of you that have been with us in our series so far, I mean, this demonstrates several things that we've been learning along the way. For instance, it shows there are not many races, but one race, not many kinds of people, but one kind of people. And one of Satan's great and masterful lies has been to convince people otherwise. It also reminds us that God-ordained authority exists in marriage with Adam, the one giving the, the name, being the head of the wife, the one receiving it. Not to be a tyrant, but to lead with love and self-sacrifice and wisdom and gentleness. You know, contrary to the anti-establishmentarianism going on in the, the Western world, authority is not a dirty word. For God sets up many authorities for the common good of all people. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that again. I'm just giving us a reminder and a taste of, of what we've been through so far. We've covered it already. The point here is the faith that Adam exhibited in the giving of this name. It's a faith that you should and must have in taking God at his word. Everything he says in Holy Scripture will come to pass. And I don't mean we... You know, rip verses out of context and twist them to fit some warped view of personal health and wealth and prosperity or to justify some sinful or foolish decision we've already made. No, not that at all. I mean that every warning given is given with teeth and fire. And every command issued demands instant obedience. And every comfort offered is wholly assured for his people. And every beckoning call is entirely sincere. And every remaining prophecy concerning his return will surely come to pass because every promise made is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. The promises of forgiveness and life, life everlasting, through the gospel of Jesus Christ for those who, like Adam, will repent and believe, and the promise of wrath and eternal dying at the judgment by Jesus Christ for those who do not. 
So either you must hope in His tender mercies through the Son of God, or you live with the consequences of ongoing rebellion against Him, against the One who is the infinite, immortal, and unchanging God, who dwells in unapproachable light and is Himself a consuming fire. Adam hoped. And may that be true of everyone here this morning, so that we need not grieve the loss of any. So that's verse 20. Now verse 21, second point, covered by the grace of God. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And perhaps for simplicity's sake, we'll look at this using four simple questions. What was their condition? What did God do for them? How did God do it? And where was this all leading? So first question, what was their condition? Well, God had created them naked and unashamed, says chapter 2. But then sin and rebellion came along, and immediately any innocence they one possessed was, was stripped away and was replaced by guilt and fear and vulnerability. Suddenly they were afraid of God and they were unable to look at the world around them without suspicion, without concern for danger, their nakedness in a way becoming a symbol of their own defiled consciences stained by sin. They now knew by those who are guilty of it. The purity with which they had been created had vanished and it was replaced by a sickening sense of guilt. So immediately, you recall, they they tried to cover up. They got fig leaves, those large interlocking leaves up to 25 centimeters wide, and they they sort of fashioned for themselves crude clothing and and then tried to hide away the same way that people are still trying to hide away, suppressing the accusations of conscience, burying them under a cloud of music or entertainment or exercise or work or prescription medication or religious activity or any of those things I listed in the beginning. They try to cover up their guilt before God and hide away anything to feel better. And yet... They remain naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This was Adam and Eve's state. Second question. What did God do for them? He clothes them. He covers them. He resumes something that he ceased to do at the end of the sixth day. God works and makes for the man and his wife a garment to hide their nakedness, to cover their shame. That their own attempts to cover themselves were flimsy, inadequate, the leaves would dry out, they become brittle and even fresh, they would, they would tear apart with movement. So the Lord God does for them what they had proven incapable of doing for themselves. Now, of course, this didn't address the underlying problem, the problem of guilt and sin before an infinite and uncompromisingly holy God. But it did set the tone for what would come. It showed Adam and Eve that God would be the one to rescue them out of their predicament. That God would be the one to cover their sin just as he now covers their nakedness. And all through the Bible, you have this constant theme of covering shame. Covering sin so as to spare the sinner. Spare them from the consequences of their crimes against the living God. The biblical word for this is simply Atonement. Atonement. Atonement does not mean at one moment. It means to cover, specifically to cover sin. And we could go to countless examples, but I'll just give you two to illustrate the principle that God does this, not us. That only God can cover sin. The first is from Isaiah 6, it's a prophetic vision. But it's easy enough to understand and get the picture. Isaiah sees the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up, and all the angels around him crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. But this glorious vision does not fill the prophet with much confidence. He's so conscious of his sins, so he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So, so what happens next? One of the angels takes a burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and touches the prophet's mouth and says, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. It's in a vision. God does for Isaiah what Isaiah could not do for himself. And the second example, still to show that only God can remove sin, is also a prophetic vision, this time from Zechariah 3, 3 to 5, and it's even easier to follow than the last. Joshua was standing before the angel of the Lord, clothed in filthy garments, filthy clothes. And the angel said to those that were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, take, taken your guilt, taken your sin, and I will clothe you with pure vestments, pure clothes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. It's not difficult to follow. God removes the polluted robes of sin. And God provides clean robes to replace them. The Lord God is the one who clothes him, covers his guilt the same way he does here with Adam and Eve. But that brings us to our third question. How did God do it? How did God cover and clothe these naked wretches in the Garden of Eden? What did he do? Still verse 21, he made for them garments of skins. I mean, it sounds particularly gruesome when you put the emphasis there, doesn't it? To be clothed in the skin of another creature, something that was born and grew and skipped and ran and ate, but is now killed and skinned to cover you. Which, of course, is the point. To clothe Adam and Eve's nakedness, to cover their guilt, something had to die. Later the Bible would say, and we know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And here, for the first time in all of the history of the universe, one creature had to physically die so as to cover the guilt-ridden nakedness of another. Okay, can you imagine how traumatic this might have been for Adam and Eve? I mean, perhaps this was one of the animals that they, they knew well. Something they had walked with, something they had ridden upon, one they had scratched behind the ears or embraced in a warm, furry hug, practically a friend they once looked upon fondly, but now chosen to die to underline for them the grievous nature of what they had done, to show that life had to be taken to cover them. Blood had to be shed, and it was not something easy. And perhaps, I think it's highly likely, God killed these animals and made these clothes before their watching eyes to impress upon them the lesson. They had to witness the slaughter of another creature, watch the draining of that lifeblood into the earth for the first time, reminding Adam and Eve at every step of the way that this is the cost of your sin. This is what sin demands. The wages of sin is death. How terrible for them to watch. We're not told what type of animal it was, but it had to be large enough to provide enough skin to cover an adult human being. And there must have been one per person because it speaks of sins there, and that makes the point that personal sins require a personal dying. And every evening, as they pulled their robes around them to fend off the biting cold, and every morning as they clothed their naked bodies, they would remember the beast that had died in their place and think more seriously about obedience to the living God going forward. And all the while they are waiting, waiting, waiting for the life giver that God promised. Don't miss how serious this lesson was for them. 
says one commentator, to us life is cheap and familiar, but Adam recognized death as the punishment of sin. Death was to early man a sign of God's anger. And he had to learn that sin could not be covered by a, a bunch of leaves snatched from a bush as he passed by that would grow again next year, but only by pain and blood. Sin cannot be atoned for by any mechanical action, nor without expenditure of feeling. Suffering must ever follow wrongdoing. From the first sin to the last, the track of the sinner is marked with blood. It was made apparent that sin was real and deep and evil, and that by no easy and cheap process would the sinner be restored. The same lesson, he continues, has been written on millions of consciences since. Men have found that their sin reaches beyond their own life and person, that it inflicts injury and involves disturbance and distress, that it changes utterly our relation to life and to God, and that we cannot rise above its consequences save by the intervention of God Himself, by an intervention which tells us of the sorrow He suffers on our account." End quote. And all through the history of the Old Testament, it was a lesson to be repeated. The, the, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the temple, it all shows that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. No covering of our guilt. The most important day in the old Jewish calendar was the Day of Atonement. You can read about it in Leviticus 16. But every year would be another sacrifice, and every generation another priest. It too could not really cover sin. It was just a reminder, because it was not through these sacrifices that sin would finally be dealt with, but through the promise made concerning the woman. The promise that Adam and Eve were now hoping in. The promise of a Savior, a life giver. Which brings us to our last question this morning. Where was all this leading? Adam and Eve, our forebearers, from whom came the whole race, guilty before God, animal sacrifices, bloodshed to cover sin. Where does it all lead? To what? To whom is it pointing? And the answer on this Good Friday morning should immediately be obvious to you. It all points to the cross. Who is the life giver that would come through Eve? Who is the one to conquer Satan and free sinners from the penalty of death? Who is the all-sufficient sacrifice? It is Jesus Christ. And not surprisingly, he is described in all the terms that we've been reading about. Jesus is the one who clothes the nakedness of his people. It says Revelation, it was granted to the church by God to clothe itself with fine linen, bright and pure. Or as the song goes, we sang it earlier on, his robes for mine, a wonderful exchange, clothed in my sins, Christ suffered neath God's rage, draped in His righteousness, I'm justified, in Christ I live, for in my place He died. Even the parables, Matthew 22, Luke 15, speak of God saving, His saving as being, uh, being prepared in fine robes and wedding garments and doing away, away with the old and inadequate rags. And the Bible also says in Genesis, Galatians 3.27 that the Christian is the one who has put on Christ. Put on Christ. What is our natural condition, naked and guilty? What does God do? He covers us with His righteousness. And how does Jesus do this? By the blood of sacrifice. Jesus is the one who atones for our sin with His own life blood. Listen to Hebrews 10 verse 4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of Me in the scroll of the book. And that is exactly what we're commemorating on Good Friday morning. You are remembering the day that the life giver first promised to Adam and Eve came and died fulfilling his father's charge to him as an atoning sacrifice so as to cover sin and clothe those who trust in him with the righteousness of God. 
Animal sacrifices weren't enough because man is not an animal. And a mere human sacrifice would not be enough because our sin is not against a mere human, but against an eternal God. So what did the Lord do for Adam and Eve, for all who would repent towards Him? He sent His own Son, the God-man, in whom all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. He came to shed His blood so as to cover our sin. It's what makes Good Friday to be good. God fulfilled His promise. He kept His word. This is the only way to cover sin. And so with the greatest of simplicity, I put before you once more the message of the Bible. What is the natural condition of all humanity because of Adam's sin and because of our own? Guilty. And naked before God because of the evil that we have done facing condemnation and judgment. What has God done to remedy this and how? He sent His only begotten Son to die in our place that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, should not die eternally in hell, but have eternal life. That is His promise, and it stands to this day, as do the other more fearful promises of Holy Scripture for those who do not believe. Therefore, what must you do? What should you do? If you are to have any hope of escaping the coming judgment for your sins, something that your conscience warns you about, what must you do? You must repent, repent of sin, and repent towards the Lord God, and place all your hope and faith and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the life giver, the only one who can cover your sin. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, You are so good. You took our sin. Now we who are in Christ are free. You are so good to us. Glorify your name on this day and in all the days until your Son returns. Bring many into your kingdom because of the finished work of Christ upon the cross. Gather in your sheep. Draw them to yourself. Do so this very day, we pray, and build up your people in faith and hope for the promises that are yet to be revealed. We ask all of this in the name of your beloved Son. Amen. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen.